It's August 1978, and Georgi Markov is in his London flat when the phone rings. He's greeted by the sound of a cold and distorted voice. Georgi Markov, you're going to die. Markov is used to these death threats. He could set his watch by them. And so he replies in his usual laconic way. Killing me will only make me a martyr. He's about to hang up, but for once, the voice has a comeback. Not this time. This time you'll not become a martyr. It will look as if you died of natural causes. You will be killed by a poison that the West can neither detect nor treat. A month later, Markov would be dead. But little did the murderer know that by giving Markov this warning, they would turn what looked like a natural death into a full-scale murder inquiry. It would become the most famous assassination of the Cold War. And yet to this day, no one has been charged with his murder. However, recently declassified documents may shed light on who was responsible and uncover the shadowy work of a mysterious organization known as Service 7, or, more bluntly, the Murder Bureau. The Murder Bureau was a top secret cell within the Bulgarian Secret Service that was tasked with carrying out assassinations throughout the world. They pursued more than 10 Bulgarian defectors to try to poison them, to kill them, to kidnap them. They were under complete control of the Russian KGB and all operations were coordinated by Moscow. There were spies, super spies, and the whole damn thing could have, for want of a better word, blown up big time into World War III. You're listening to Forbidden History, the podcast series that explores the past's darkest corners, sheds light on the lives of intriguing individuals, and uncovers the truth buried deep in history's most controversial legacies. I'm Janine Hironi, and this is The Murder Bureau. In the latter half of the 20th century, the world is in the midst of the Cold War. The capitalist West and the communist East exist in an uneasy truce. The world's leaders gaze at each other warily with the most powerful weapons in history at their disposal, and their people live with the specter of the nuclear Armageddon they could deliver. But what few people realized is that on their streets, and hidden in plain sight, a covert war is underway. Guy Walters is an author and historian. There are spies running around the world bumping each other off, literally bumping each other off, just as we see in Len Dayton books, Ian Fleming books. Those books may be fiction, but they describe a lot of very true type of events in which spies are using skullduggery to outwit each other, people are being poisoned, shot, stabbed, they're being seduced by Romeo or honey trap methods. The intelligence world is very much a very dark counterpoint to the kind of gaudy flower power that we tend to associate with that time. It is to this secret war that Georgi Markov becomes a victim a month after the phone call warning him of his impending death. Historians Guy Walters and Richard Felix talk us through Markov's final moments. He was standing on a street near Waterloo Bridge. And he waits by the bus stop just at the top of the bridge to get his bus to the BBC. Suddenly he feels this prick in the back of his thigh. Thought he'd been stunned. Nothing more than that. And he turns round, you know, bewildered as you might be, um, to see a man who's dropped an umbrella then races across the road and gets into a cab and scuttles off. Little Red Pimple turned up. He started to feel ill. Over the next few hours, he begins to feel more and more sick, more and more unwell. Made a comment when he went home that he thought he may have been poisoned. Off to hospital. No one knows exactly what is happening to him. Four days later, he was dead. Were it not for the phone call threatening his impending death and the claim that the method would make it look like natural causes, no further action would have been taken. But Markov had told the doctors treating him 
that he believed himself to have been poisoned. And so his death becomes a murder inquiry. And at his post-mortem, the London Metropolitan Police discovered just how sophisticated his assassination had been. A forensic scientist removes a tissue sample from Markov's leg and sends it to the chemical weapons laboratory in Porton Down. There, they find a tiny pellet in the sample, less than two millimeters in diameter, with two holes drilled into it. Further examination cannot detect any trace of poison inside the cavities. Through process of elimination, they determine that it once contained the deadly poison, ricin. This, combined with Markov's testimony, enables them to build a picture of events. Astonishingly, they believed that an assassin fired the ricin pellet into Markov's leg, using a weapon disguised as an umbrella. The news hits the headlines, and the assassination captures the world's imagination, sparking endless speculation about who was responsible. And yet, to this day, the case remains open. So who ordered Markov's assassination? Who invented such a sophisticated weapon? And who pulled the trigger? The answer to the first question lies in Georgi Markov's past and his rapid turnaround in fortunes. Georgi Markov is born in Bulgaria in 1929 and becomes one of the country's success stories. Educated as a chemical engineer, he pursues his passion for writing in his spare time. His work strikes a chord with the people of Bulgaria and propels him to fame as one of the country's leading novelists and playwrights. With fame comes patronage. Markov is indicted into the inner circle of Bulgaria's president, Tador Zhivkov himself. The pair are known to have dinner together and go on hikes through the Bulgarian countryside. But there is a ruthless streak in Markov's patron and evidence of it can still be seen today in the capital, Sofia. The building that once housed the headquarters of Bulgaria's Committee for State Security, known as KDS. Bulgarian journalist Alexenia Dimitrova has agreed to show us around today. Okay, this building is now National Archive, but it used to be until 1972 the headquarters of the Bulgarian State Security. And come, I'll show you something very interesting. Here, in the basement, there were cells of the Bulgarian state security. We enter into a clean marble-walled lobby, but Alexenia takes us through a door and down a staircase into the bowels of the building itself. Guy Walters. These are, you know, from the outside, just normal office blocks. They're just in that sort of structural, you know, sort of brutalist architecture we associate with that period. Yeah, they look pretty grim, but, you know, they look like any office from that period. They have desks, they have telephones, they may have had a, a you know, a picture of a, of a leader somewhere in the office. But it's when you go into the basements that things look very, very, very different indeed. The gleaming walls of the atrium give way to dank, dark corridors with a grim past. Alexenia takes us into a small room off the corridor. The walls are covered in grime and the lighting is dim. Alexenia. They kept prisoners here and so they tortured them and they beat them severely to extract some evidence from them. We asked historian Richard Felix about the interrogation methods the KDS employed. In that basement, um, obviously a chair, when you'd be sat there, you'd be interrogated, probably beaten, uh, but also still preserved, there are two um, boxes, electrical boxes from the 60s that are not connected in any way now, but were originally connected to a metal bed. Um, people would be strapped to the bed. All manner of electrocution to various parts of the body would be carried out. No one was ever brought in through the front door. They were always brought downstairs and brought in the back. This was a dirty war. 